Hi, everybody. Welcome to our first speaker series event of 2015. We're excited to bring you a session on performance management today. I'm Mara Williams Lowe, the program director of the Sobrato Family Foundation. And thank you all for joining us. This is quite a packed house. Um, there are some extra seats in back. You can go ahead and, and filter in and um, Let's go ahead and get started. So thank you all. We had a networking question posted on the screen. If you could collect any data to help you learn and improve, what would it be and why? And if you do track really meaningful data, what is it um, and how has it helped your organization? So quickly to respond to that from our end, um, it's something that we as a foundation grapple with a lot and have been talking about internally. Um, certainly if any of you are our grantees and have filled out our application, you know we like our data and it certainly collect a lot of it. And really the, the challenge is um, making meaningful information out of that data. How can it help you um, change your programming? On our end, how can it help us really make our grant making more impactful? And from a foundation perspective, really it's about all of you. So our grantees and the nonprofits that are serving our community are the ones that are making such meaningful impact on the community we're aiming to serve. So as we think about rolling up our data and making sure our data helps us inform our programming, um, it's, also, it's also up to our grantee partners to make sure that um, you all are also collecting the meaningful data and we're partnering on that. So um, as, we, as we look at this work, um, a lot of what we want to try to do is help increase the capacity of our grantee partners, provide some tools and resources, and a lot of the wisdom is out there in the nonprofit sector. It's all, it's all there in peers and colleagues, and so we're so privileged to bring um, a great uh, nonprofit partner to, to the area from back east who has vast um, knowledge and expertise in this field. So Tiffany Cooper Guy, who has a PhD in educational research and is also a CEO of an organization that's using and implementing this data on a daily basis. So uh, information from the, the technical perspective as well as the day-to-day -day, um, perspective of putting this information to use. So reflecting on that, what data would we track if we could and why? There are a lot of um, pieces of information that are um, going to inform that you can measure, that you can calculate. And some of the things I'm sure that you all um, struggle with as well is how do you track the, the more intangible? So just uh, how do we look at what the impact is of a series like this? How do we look at what the impact is of our, one of our programs with our Sobrato Centers for Nonprofits, where we have organizations who are getting in-kind rent? What are those resources if we were to um, reallocate it? What, what are those resources that our grantee partners are saving? How is that impacting the community? So we're also looking at um, several ways that we would like to measure and look at our data. So our series last year, we started with the building blocks to creating greater impact. We started with theories of change and logic models, uh, business models to support sustainability and scale, and the leadership and culture that in, is needed to be in place to make all of that happen. Um, and today we go a little bit deeper, deeper on performance management and the metrics and evaluation that we need in order to make sure that our theories of change are um, accurate, are working, are, and that our programs are going in the right direction. So um, we are thrilled to partner with Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. This year we're, we're working with some of the um, great organizations in our area to deliver this content. On the back of your handout, we have some information of their next session coming up on March 17th. So it's great to partner with organizations that have um, the, the same type of um, goals and ambition to really help uh, foster and support great development in the nonprofit sector. And I also want to thank my, my partner in this series, Alexa Cortez Kowal, who's helped me curate this um, session. And it's, it's just a delight to work with her and um, to be able to produce this with her for you all. Uh, one other thing I want to announce really quickly, we've launched a resource guide on our website. So all last year, we had these excellent speakers who had a wealth of information of some resources that were available for um, the types of topics that we were covering. So some of them are articles, books, resources, videos, TED Talks, this great wealth of information, and we published them one by one. And now we've pulled it all together into an online resource guide. So there's information on your handout. 
And on each of these sessions, we're going to be releasing a new list that's really topical and applicable to the current um, session. So you can go ahead and go on our website after and download some of the resources, or just go ahead and view, view the videos. So um, before we get us started, I want to walk us through a quick survey uh, just to see who's in the room. It helps the speakers address and uh, really aim the, the, um, the content towards your needs. So it's a little bit different. Those of you, uh, you who have joined us last year, it's pretty quick and easy. You just get out your smartphones. If you can, I'm sure we all, we all have them there. And to join the session, it's all through text. Um, you type in Sobrato to 22333 to join the session. And then once the polls pop up on the screen, type in an A, B, C, D, or E, and then we advance to the next slide. So the first one, just what is your role at your organization? Oh, sorry. And I can't see. OK, it's 22333. And you go ahead and type in Sobrato. Is everybody there? No? OK. We'll wait. It'll go a little faster from here, because that's the, the first thing you need to do for each of them. You can also do it online, pollev.com slash Sobrato. And you just click on the buttons. but. Um, the text is a little bit faster, just so we don't slow down the Wi-Fi service in the building. OK. So you can continue to do that as we advance to the next slide with the first poll question. So what is your role in your organization? And the responses are executive director or part of the executive team. That's A. Just type in a quick A to respond. Other staff member of the organization or a board member is C. And we'll see they all have live results as you go. Great. Everybody's responding. It's working. It's always nice. So it looks like a lot of staff, a few board members in attendance here. Give you a couple more minutes to keep responding. I see them clicking and continuing to come. Great. Very helpful. So one of the things that we'll address is having that data available at all levels of the organization is really helpful toward alignment to make sure that you're all working in the same direction. So it's great to see that it is split um, a little bit half and half between um, executive directors and other staff members. OK, let's go ahead and advance to the next one. To learn a little bit more about your organizations, just give it a second to catch up. How old is your organization? So we're trying to see about development. Obviously, we're going to hear from an organization that has a lot of experience in this field, but um, there's really places to get started at all areas of an organization. So is your organization A, less than five years old, different development, or five to 15 years old? That's B. C, 15 to 25 years old, or D, more than 25 years old? Wow. So we have some organizations who've um, been existing. It's quite some time here. That's great to see. Good. That was quick. We're all moving along pretty quickly now. OK. I don't want to take too much credit for coming right after soldier surgery, but this is very <laughs> important. This is uh, our effort to give back, our effort to do our best to bring speakers in and experts in to allow all of us you and us to to get to the next level so we're very excited to be able to do this um, last year it was an overwhelming success and we got a tremendous amount of feedback so hopefully you see us incorporating that in this year and i think um, as we go forward we're going to try to do that so the the goal today before i bring tiffany up is we're going to try to make it a little more interactive than we did last year so we're going to have her do her presentation and then i'm going to ask her some questions so you get to know her a little bit better and then we're going to try to open it up there's a lot of you in here, so we're already anticipating. I'm already stressed about how I'm going to get field all the questions, but we are going to, I'm going to channel Oprah as best I can and <laughs> make sure that we get as many as we want, because that's what it's about, is giving you the opportunity to ask the questions of someone that is actually doing it and, and, um, and doing it in a way that, that has been nationally recognized. So we're very excited about that. Um, we'll also do some more polling during the process as well. 
Um, so we'll have more opportunities to use that tool. So before I start, I want to thank Mara and Alexa as well. This has been a great, a great uh, gift that the foundation gives the community, and I think it's something that we'll continue to do. And I also see Lisa has arrived, so thank you, Lisa, for my boss. So I want to acknowledge her as <laughs> for coming. She's been very supportive of this and very supportive of everything we're trying to do to build the capacity of the nonprofits in the community. So without further ado, let me um, go ahead and, and welcome Tiffany and tell you a little bit about her. I think you have her bio, but um, it, it goes, it's worth repeating because it's uh, very impressive. So uh, Tiffany Cooper Guy, um, Dr. Guy, um, is the chief executive of Bell, Building Educated Leaders for Life. Um, it's a national nonprofit that is focused on working in schools in high poverty areas and through after school work and um, supplemental work during the summer, they, they focus on advancing uh, those kids' educational attainment, closing the educational gap in those high need schools. She has worked at Bell since 1998 in a variety of roles, starting at program manager, then went to director of evaluation, then went to COO, and is now the, the CEO. Um, during that time, the organization has grown to serving 15,000 youths. And I think why that is also important is um, the scale is, is very impressive, but it's also how they got there. And you'll hear that story. It's a matter of growing in line with your impact and your, your going, not just growing for, for growing's sake, not just growing because the money's there, but growing in line with when you can tell your story. And so she has a very interesting story about that. Um, that you'll hear later on. Um, Tiffany has won a number of awards. I won't go into all that, I think, <laughs> but they're very impressive. So um, she's uh, 40 under 40 achiever. She's the um, Be the Change Award recipient. As I said, she has a PhD in educational research and a BA in psychology, um, and has, serves on many, many boards. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Guy, and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, thanks for welcoming me, everyone. I am uh, really pleased to be here, in part because I came in from Boston, where we are buried in snow. Uh, so I'm, I'm especially happy to be here. Um, no, but I am thrilled <coughs> to talk to you about performance management. Uh, in particular, of course, I'll talk to you about how my organization does performance management. Um, I think the idea is that by seeing real examples um, of how an organization is used, utilizing some principles, uh, you'll potentially get some new ideas, um, have some questions, maybe even offer me some suggestions if the time allows. Um, but the idea is to hear about how one organization does it, how we've used it to reach more kids. Um, so I'm just going to peek to see if the slides are perfect. Uh, so here's just an outline of what I'd cover. Um, I'm going to use about 25 minutes to share a few things, and, uh, and then we'll get into the more interactive part. But certainly, if there's a clarification I can make, um, feel free to raise your hands, and I'll try to peek around. Um, what I'll use the 25 minutes to do is give you a very brief overview of Bell so that you have a little bit more context and can then draw some um, conclusions about how much this might apply to you or where it applies to you. I'll tell you about Bell's journey with performance management because it is a journey. It's ongoing. We're still in it. I'll tell you about our current approach, of course, and I'll show you some examples of tools we use. And then I'll share some key insights and experiences we've had with um, three particular dimensions that I think are real success factors with uh, thinking about performance management in practice. And they are organizational culture, collecting the right amount of data, and then some best practices and how to actually use the data, which I think is key. Great. So a little bit of context on Bell. We, um, our mission is to uh, transform the educational achievements, the self-confidence, and the life trajectories of children living in under-resourced urban communities. We were founded in Boston about 22 years ago, almost 23. We do serve um, now 15,000. We've grown to that level of scale. We serve K through 8 students who attend high poverty schools. Uh, our, our organizational budget is about $24 million. We are working to narrow the achievement gap between lower income and higher income students by leveraging their out of school time. So we of course believe that kids should have a great K through 12 experience, but we know low income students aren't getting what they need outside of school. And so that's where Bell um, 
intends to add value, but we do that in close partnership with city leaders, philanthropies, school districts, principals, um, and other community-based organizations. So um, hopefully even there's some partnerships to be made after today's presentation with some of you. We um, are doing that um, with the most challenged schools and students. So we work really hard to identify high poverty schools and then the lowest performing students in those schools. Okay, so we are, we are intentionally targeting the most challenged students. And I have been with Bell for uh, 16 years. Um, yes, I started when I was five. And, um, and I've been the CEO for six and a half of those years. So I, I told you that um, Bell's journey uh, with performance management is still underway. And I, I would say it started really in about 1999. But in 2005, we had a, a, a key sort of crisis, a burning platform, if you will, that really kind of changed the way we were thinking about performance management. So I'm going to tell you that story so that um, you hopefully avoid this sort of crisis in your evolution, but, but it changed things. We had, um, it was a wake-up call for us. Our performance management approach from about 1999 to 2005 was really focused on programmatic performance. So pre- and post-test outcomes, are we achieving the outcomes we intend to for the kids we serve? Uh, and, and we were somewhat overly focused on that. That was an important place to start. But we weren't looking at any of the other inputs or organizational performance milestones that make strong programs possible. So in 2005, um, we had this opportunity to dramatically scale up our work. Is anybody familiar with Supplemental Educational Service Vouchers, SES? Raise your hand if you know SES. OK, raise your hand if you love SES. OK, nobody, right, exactly. Uh, so, so this was a, this voucher program that um, the federal government made available across the country to low-income students um, in high-poverty schools who are low-performing. So exactly Bell's target population for after-school programs uh, that are rigorous with academics, exactly what Bell does. So it was this great economic engine for us to serve more kids. We grew from, in New York City as an example, 200 scholars to 1,000 scholars, literally overnight. On Friday, we had 200 scholars in our program. On Monday, we had 1,100. So it really allowed us to dramatically scale up. The one difference, though, that this um, funding source required was that we pay New York City teachers their contract rate. And that was $42 an hour. That was really expensive for us. We hadn't been paying teachers that much. So it was a stretch, but we put it in our budget, $42 an hour for the 500 teachers. They're going to work three hours a day five days a week, et cetera, et cetera. So we just we put it in the budget, and we just accounted for it. But in reality, uh, here's what actually happened with performance uh, across four boroughs in New York City that we were working with. We had um, these really great teachers decide, I'm going to show up to the program 30 minutes early to help set up my materials, you know, get my stuff ready. Um, and then they were so generous that they decided they were going to stay for 30 minutes after to help clean up. These teachers, they're so thoughtful. But I got to get there early and start early, and then I got to stay late. So this was great. Actually, you know, good. You know, chip in, be prepared, help clean up afterward. So that, was, that was great. Um, so they would sign their paper timesheets, because um, we were using paper timesheets for four hours every day instead of three. Um, but so here's how that adds up. One extra hour, so $42 um, times 500 teachers times five days per week, times 12 hours, 12 weeks. So this was 12 weeks, just one quarter of our school year. Any guesses how much that added up to, top of your head? A lot. We were over budget by $1.2 million, over budget, one quarter. And we found out after the quarter was over, and we looked at the financials. So the looks on your faces right now is exactly what we were all doing. We were like, what is happening? We can't afford this. We can't sustain this. This is a crisis. What happened? And the, part, the, the problem was, too, we were asking what happened. We actually didn't know. You know, we had budgeted something, and we would ran the program, we thought, according to that plan. And so we really didn't know. This later we characterized um, as shift management. We sort of use that language now at Bell around shift management. And it's somewhat classic, I think, with growth. We ultimately scaled up to 5,000 scholars in New York City. Um, so you can imagine we, we weren't going to be able to sustain this level of shift mismanagement. So we needed some real key metrics to help us understand shifts. 
We had challenges also that year with ratios. So for example, we have uh, our program models suggest that every one adult has eight scholars that they work with. But if scholars aren't attending regularly, you have only five or six scholars show up to a session for every one adult. That's not something we can afford regularly. Uh, similarly, if an adult doesn't show up, then you have you know, 12 scholars for every one adult or 14. That is not good for quality or outcomes. So there were all sorts of things that we were learning when you start to grow at a bigger scale. You really need data on that to monitor it and to manage it. And so these were some of the things we learned. Our New York um, recruiters who were hiring these teachers, they would sometimes interview the teachers and they'd say, you know, you're great. You've actually worked with us now for two years. I'm going to give you a raise. I'm going to give you a raise. You're so great. You're so talented. You've worked with us for four years. I'm going to give you a, rage, a, ways, a, a wage raise. Before we knew it, our average wage was actually $43 an hour instead of $42 like we had budgeted. That $1 difference is about $100,000 more expense than we had budgeted. So there were things, so this was a sort of burning platform for us. Um, and I talked about some of the financial implications of it, but there were also program quality implications, outcome implications. So what did we learn? We had to be more clear about all the different drivers of performance that mattered. It wasn't just about the child's experience and the child's outcome in our program. It was all the different indicators of performance. And we had to have lots of different people in the organization aware of those drivers and committed to managing them. So the recruiter in New York had to know and understand why the average wage made a difference. The, the person managing the site had to know and understand why shift management made a difference. And we had to work together to find alternative ways to get the program set up and get the program cleaned up because we couldn't afford um, an extra hour of a $42 an hour teacher. So we had to sort of get clear on what and make sure that all levels of the organization were bought in. In this particular instance, we started to, um, investing in an online recruiting platform so that we could have a centralized database about everybody's wage uh, and the average wages. We have an electronic time card system now so that we know what everybody's shift is on a regular basis. We don't have to wait for the paper timesheets to come in or worse yet, wait for the, the budget, the books to close. Um, we also know what the daily ratios are. We use uh, attendance technologies on, sites, on site, and we have uh, Salesforce.com as a platform. So today, right now, um, it's about 9. No, it's too early. In a couple of hours, I could actually go into Salesforce.com from wherever I am and know what's the average pay wage, what's the average ratio at our after-school program sites this afternoon, and um, whether or not shifts were managed over the course of last week. We have real-time data. Um, but of course, this was um, part of our journey. This didn't happen overnight. And so part of what I want to do is tell you more about what it took to get there. So our current approach, or rather, so this just briefly sort of uh, shows you a little bit about where we were before we started and where we've come to now. So um, in 1999, like I said, when we first started on this journey, we had Actually, an independent study that was done of Bell. When I started, um, I found a two, couple years later, I found it on a shelf. Literally, found it on a shelf, and it said, "Oh, what is this? We had a we had an independent study done, and um, our founder at the time sort of told me what it was about, but nobody had used it on staff at all. I, I actually found it on a shelf, so that concept of sitting on a shelf was real. Um, we didn't have our staff really participating in data collection when when we first started." Um, they, they saw themselves as program people serving kids. You know, what do I know about collecting data? That's not, that's not a good use of my time. I don't, know what, I don't know how to do it. I don't think it's a good allocation of my time. We didn't have real feedback loops to use data. And there was, as a result, this really big gap between what our founder and what our leadership had as a vision for serving kids. You know, we serve kids. We serve them well. There are, we want to reach hundreds of thousands of kids. You know, we have, we're financially strong. We'll find the resources to do it. So there was like this big vision. And then there was this other place where we actually were, where there was some inconsistency in how we were delivering programs, how kids were experiencing it, what their outcomes were, and how well we were actually managing organizational performance and therefore how financially strong we were. Um, but today, you know, lots of good things can be um, said about Bell's performance management approach, which is why I think we were invited here. So we do have now, I'm proud to say, really consistent outcomes across all of the sites as we've grown to reach 15,000 youth. We do that across 19 communities in the US. 
and it's consistent, the quality and the outcomes. We have um, a lot of financial discipline and a lot of financial indicators of strength. We have our team from top to bottom, inside and out, fully engaged in our strategy and our mission, which is important. And um, we have done two rigorous third-party evaluations, randomized controlled trial studies. Um, you don't have to do that as part of your performance management. It's something we have done. But um, the really important thing to know is that we use that at Bell. And we hope it's useful to the field. It wasn't just done for the sake of checking a box. And um, our frontline staff is fully on board with helping us collect data. So our current approach. We start by looking at what performance we want to optimize. Uh, and so for us, we want to optimize our program performance and our organizational performance. Because our pro the perfect program won't be well implemented if the organization is not strong. To inform our performance, program performance, we rely on our theory of change, uh, which if you participated in last year's series, I think you got a lot of exposure to. The theory of change tells you a lot about what sort of uh, inputs and outputs and outcomes you want to be looking at with regard to your program delivery and its effectiveness. And so we use that. For organizational performance, sometimes that's harder because there are, you could list out dozens and dozens of signals of an organization's performance. So how do we narrow it? We use our strategic plan. Every three years we have a plan for you know, who we want to serve and how we're going to do it. What sort of capacity do we need? What sort of systems do we need? How much money do we need to raise? That's part of the plan. And then we create organizational milestones for every year. And that becomes where we focus our organizational performance management process. Okay, so and you know, we could we could miss the boat on that. You know, to the extent that we nail it, then we're then we're actually managing the right things. We could miss it, but you have to make some choices in the process. And um, then after we get clear on what we want to optimize in terms of program performance and organizational performance, then we, um, closely coupled with that, we start thinking about how we're going to use the data. So at Bell, we have um, four purposes. We use it to align all of our stakeholders. We use data to monitor, of course, performance. We use it to report, which is probably one of the most uh, significant uses, I think, across our sector. We all feel like we have to collect a lot of data to report back to our funders. Um, and they make us collect so much data. I'm just kidding. Um, they do, right? Um, so, we, so to report, that's one of our purposes. Um, but to improve, that's a really important purpose for Bell. We want to make sure that we're using data for formative and for summative purposes. And um, I think it's really important for you all to know there's an enormous amount of data we collect at Bell that never gets seen outside of Bell for external purposes at all. Much more data, in fact, than we ever report externally. And that's um, a, of tremendous value to us, which I'll tell you more about. Um, we, we use data. And your performance management approach should be about how you're going to use it. So I didn't list here um, one of the purposes is to prove. So we have collected data to help prove the efficacy of our program, these two independent evaluations I told you about. But that's not a part of our ongoing performance management. I would say if you're, one of your purposes of doing this is to prove that something works, then I think you're potentially not going to be asking all the right questions. Okay, so we, we do try to prove, but that's not one of our ongoing purposes. And we don't limit ourselves to things we are required to report externally. So a couple of examples. On the program performance side, this is an excerpt from our theory of, th of change where we sort of have some goals for the children we serve, the scholars we serve. We want them to avoid summer learning loss, for example. We want them to gain literacy and math skills, um, gain self-confidence. You can see them all on the left. So there are some goals we have for the kids. And then on the right, we have some program core essentials that we want to see implemented at the program sites. These are important indicators to us of if these things are happening on the right, then we can feel reasonably assured that we're on track to achieve the goals. And so we built um, programmatic performance measurement around measuring these things. <clears throat> Some of them are um, more straightforward. Um, gain literacy and math skills. You can use an achievement test in reading and math. You've got to find the right one for you. And you can measure that, and you know whether there are gains. Others are harder to um, put into measurement terms, like uh, teaching excellence. When you go to a program site, what does teaching excellence look like? 
So we had to get clear with each of these on what would be satisfactory to us. What would it look like if it were happening? How do we describe it in measurable, observable terms? And then that became how we measured a bunch of these things. So on the right, for example, with program um, core essentials, we have uh, tablet devices and an app that we developed with an organization called TeachPoint where we go to our sites and we observe. There's a rubric. It's very detailed. And it's essentially trying to help us understand whether these, this short list of five things is happening in a classroom and to what degree. So that if it's not, we can use it to actually intervene and improve. And to the extent that it is, we feel good about program quality and consistency across sites. Okay? And using a tablet allows that to go faster. It also allows it to roll up so that, again, I can look in the system this afternoon and tell you about program quality over the last few weeks, as opposed to knowing at the end when the outcomes are or are not achieved for the children that we're serving. Here are some, uh, actually, I'm going to go back. It's too fast. Um, here's some outcome data. This is real outcome data for Bell. Um, and so don't use your devices to like take a picture because this is, I'm showing you real data for the purpose of being transparent and instructive and I'm happy to answer questions about it. But from the summer of 2013, for example, we use uh, a, an assessment called STAR. It's um, a computer adaptive test that we administer to all the scholars participating pre and post program. And we want to see what did they gain in terms of literacy and math skills. So on average, you'll see on, in reading on the left, scholars gained 1.4 great equivalent months. And our program is about five or six weeks. It varies a little bit. but So they gained about five or six weeks worth of reading skills. And in math, they gained 1.7, so about five or six um, weeks worth of math skills. So this is a good outcome for us um, because we wanted to avoid summer learning loss and we wanted to help them make gains. So this was good. Um, but of course, it's an aggregate. Uh, in the summer of 2013, we served maybe 7,500 or almost 8,000 children. So this is an average across all of them. So we asked ourselves. Um, without an external party asking us or without reporting it, was this true of all students or did it vary? You know, what makes up that average? Um, do girls and boys achieve the same? Do different grade levels achieve the same? Because we want to learn all the time. So one of the interesting findings we, we got from that exercise was we learned that um, students who start at the lowest quartile, so the absolute lowest performing of the students that come into our program, they actually gained much more. So 2.4 months in reading after just five weeks and 3.9 grade equivalent months in math. So really extraordinary gains for the lowest performing students. That's really instructive for us in terms of who we should be recruiting and maybe even what goes on in the classroom. So you know, in order to try to learn from this, we have um, what we call lesson learn sessions where we'll all sit together and we'll say, well, why would a child who was the lowest quartile have gained the most? Maybe they had the most to make up. They had the most to gain. Maybe the teachers were actually treating them differently in the classroom, sort of over allocating their attention because they could tell from the pretest data that they needed the most help. So they're actually benefiting from over allocation of the teacher's time. What do we feel about that in terms of the scholars who weren't the lowest quartile? So we have sort of discussions and we generate insights so that we're actually using the data. Uh, here's another interesting one. Really showing you the dirty laundry here. We looked across the um, aggregate to say, is this true across each of our regions? And if not, where does it vary? And so um, you'll see on the left, using the STAR assessment, um, so there should be an apples to apples comparison. There was some variability across each of the regions Bell operates in. And you'll see there was a good deal of consistency in math across Massachusetts, North Carolina, and California. Um, but that something extraordinary was going on in Baltimore. The gains there were really large. And that something um, was going on in, with California reading gains that we wanted to look at further. So again, we could use these lessons learned sessions. We, uh, understood from the deep dive on this data that in California we had many more English language learners who were uh, in middle school, so really far behind, um, that our programming needed to evolve to meet those needs. Uh, and in Baltimore, we found that there were some really extraordinary best practices going on, especially in math, where they had been working with the school district to actually enhance what we offered in terms of our standard program. And so we, we had an opportunity to replicate that across additional sites. So on the organizational performance, we, as I told you, you know, it's, I think it's harder 
And so it took us longer as an organization to determine, well, what are the indicators of organizational performance and how do I optimize organizational performance? So at Bell, we use our strategic plan to identify the, the top um, uh, objectives that we'll have for a given year. And they're usually about um, nine. So these are sort of spread out. What we try to do is um, we share it with staff via a, a webinar with all of our staff. It has to fit on one slide. We spaced it out here so that uh, it wasn't so dense, but sometimes it is incredibly dense because we're intentional about making it fit on one slide. And we do that because we don't want um, our organizational objectives to be or overwhelming, um, but we do want them to be comprehensive. So for us, it's about always, first and foremost, the impact that we'll have, and that's inclusive of the reach and the outcomes we achieve for children. We have some growth aspirations in this particular year. We have um, a financial sustainability milestone. We want to diversify our revenue. We want to leverage more regional funding um, so that we're not so dependent on national funding, things like that. So we get clear about what needs to be true of Bell this year so that we feel like we're on track. Um, we want to sink deep roots into communities. We want to make sure we're creating the kind of partnerships that allow us to really be the best organization we can be. Um, and we want to um, innovate with our program all the time. So these are the types of things we identify. And then here's an, a dashboard that we use, an example of a dashboard. So we turn those organizational objectives into, um, for each one of the bullets you just saw, we then think about, well, what would this look like over the course of the year? And in each quarter, what kind of progress would we have need to make? So on the financial sustainability, we have a fundraising target where we want to ensure a robust national uh, contributed revenue stream. And so we sort of say, OK, that's our target. What does that look like quarter by quarter so that we can monitor it? And we create a Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 target. And then we have this dashboard every quarter. So we don't do this every day. But every quarter, we look at how well we're doing. And then we give ourselves a traffic signal status light. Um, it's just a dot, a colored dot. And it's either going to be green, means you know pretty much good shape. But I'll tell you more about what those mean. Um, because it's important. Yellow would be what you would think, and red would, would be negative, that we're not um, trending the way we want. But we use these dashboards across all of the different uh, goals that we have. In the end, there are probably about 20 slides in the dashboard. And so we have a summary slide. The, the thing I'd also mention about this is that this doesn't include the shift management, the ratios, the average wages. This particular dashboard is for the senior management team at Bell and for the board. And that, at that level, we're not looking at the shifts and uh, the wages. But we do have uh, a director level team that is responsible for that, and they are looking at that. So part of how we make all of this manageable is we have different people depending on your role. There's different data you're focused on. So here's um, where the senior team and the board focuses. These 20 slides, we create a summary. And um, the key piece to highlight on this particular slide is that those uh, traffic signals mean something in particular. So if it's green, we have an action verb associated with that. That means celebrate. If it's yellow, we monitor. If it's red, we, it's act now. That means some action needs to be taken. So we don't look at our dashboard and say green, good, yellow, OK, you know, red, that's bad. We don't use it to characterize performance. We use it to take action. So there's an action verb associated with each color status. Okay, and it really serves to help people understand why we're taking action. Because there was a red, was a red bulb. So to sort of wrap up, there are going to be, uh, I'm just going to present sort of three, three more slides to talk about some of the key insights we've had across um, what I think are key success factors. The first being using data to drive performance. Two key lessons here. The first is provide visibility. So once you start developing your system and your approach, make sure there's visibility throughout the organization. You don't want a study that sits on a shelf for sure. But you also don't want your staff unaware of why different indicators or different metrics matter to the organization. You don't want them unaware that it matters or why it matters. So we, we use dashboards that are simplified. People can sort of consume a dashboard and see a color signal. And it makes it sort of easy for them to consume it. And uh, we also have personalized dashboards in Salesforce.com. So my colleague, Chris Murray, is here. When she signs into Salesforce.com, she'll see a dashboard that's relevant to her, and I'll see one that's relevant to me. 
Uh, and we have all staff webinars every quarter where I share with the whole team how we're doing against the organizational milestones. Uh, personnel performance review, that's been a key lesson in Bell's journey with performance management. Personnel reviews should be closely tied, of course, with organizational performance and programmatic performance. And so the things you decided um, in your process were important for optimizing program performance and organizational performance should show up in people's personnel goals um, and in their performance reviews. So we, over this you know, last 16 years, got better and better at making sure performance reviews were done every year at the same time of year for everybody in a timely fashion. We got better at making sure there was calibration across reviewers because if, uh, if you four are in the same organization and uh, you're giving people fives but you're, because you're more of a, a raw rock kind of manager and you're more of a, I want to keep the bar really high so I'm going to give everybody threes, um, that messes up the calibration. So we, ins we inserted, as an example, a next uh, reviewer up signatures required so that whoever is the supervisor for you four can sort of look across and say you guys aren't rating differently. We also created more consistency between our org performance and the reviews. So there, w there have been years at Bell where you know, the average performance review will come in and everybody's like a four or five or the average across the whole company is 4.8. So it's like, great guys, we have high performing team, but our enrollment was off by 10%. Our revenue was off by 15%. But, but gee, we have some real high performers in the organization. You know, organizational performance has to match up with performance reviews. And so that was a, a, a teachable moment in terms of all of us getting together and saying, really, if everybody is rocking and rolling, why isn't our org performing the way we want? Um, and, and that was uh, an opportunity for us to get more alignment. Um, and then uh, we, with our performance reviews, of course, have incredibly measurable things related to performance, but then we also have values as part of those. We don't want our staff to feel like um, we're just looking at data um, and everything is driven by the numbers. There are, There is, of course, a values-based component to the performance review. You know, to what extent are you collaborating with your colleagues? To what extent are you, um, you know, showing initiative? Things like that, that that are also contributing. The second of the three areas that I, I'm going to just double click on for a second, is collecting the right amount of data. There was definitely a point in Bell's journey with this where we were swimming in data. We were buried in data like the snow that's covering Boston right now. There was a lot of it. Um, but the biggest problem with that was that the staff who has to collect that data was really just collecting data. You know, like I would go to a program site and people are like scanning this with their scan gun and they're fixing it in the system over here and they're printing out this report. They're not interacting with parents and they're not interacting with scholars. So that was a problem. So we had to figure out, well, let's collect the right amount of data, not just lots of data. So a few things have helped us. Um, one is automation. As much as you can automate and not make a manual process, uh, that of course requires resources, but, um, but you'd be surprised um, how much resource it takes to do things manually too. Um, so if you can find a way to invest in some automation, that helps. Um, evaluate the utility of the data you're collecting. Uh, if the information isn't changing over time, or if your question isn't the same, don't keep collecting it. So an example for us was um, when a scholar starts our program in the fall, our after school program, and then they withdraw before the end in the spring, we'd reach out to their parents and we'd say, why did you withdraw from the program? We wanted feedback on, did you not like it? You know, what, what was going on? And you know, consistently we would get back the exact same things. They want to do spring sports when spring sports start in the fall, in the spring. Um, and Bell doesn't really do you know soccer and baseball and some of the things that they were interested in. They had tra uh, like transportation issues because they moved over the course of the year. So literally after five years, we were getting back the exact same responses. We didn't need to keep collecting that. We weren't learning anything new. So we didn't. We don't ask that anymore. We know enough about why kids withdraw now, so we don't need to keep asking that question. So that, that might be a way for you to eliminate some of the questions you're asking. Um, and then another thing we, we do is we engage volunteer leaders at the board level. So we have our full board, but we also have a program committee of the board, and we have an evaluation advisory board that is different. And by engaging these folks in what we're collecting and how we're using it, it they can provide sort of pre fresh perspective on, you know, hey, I, I don't, I don't really see how you could use that. 
Like that seems rather ordinary kind of information. You might actually even just know that from reading the literature on this subject. How about this that could actually inform your strategy? Or how about this other thing? So by, sometimes by engaging outside leaders, and it's, it can be scary because you're, you're providing a level of exposure into your information. But if somebody is, um, has been recruited to your board, you know, you gotta imagine you can have that level of transparency with them and that they're gonna help your process. Uh, so that's, that's been a best practice. 